I called him and said in July uh, 1989, a month before <coughs> the uh, transition to the post-communist government, and I said, How's, how are your negotiations going? He said, Jeff, you know who I just spoke to on the phone? I said, no. Uh, Gorbachev. Gorbachev called me. Gorbachev called the dissident advisor to Lech Wałęsa, And Gorbachev said, you people should join the government. You, you should get in the government. I'm going to talk to Yaroslavsky about that. So Gorbachev helped to create the coalition government that came into office in August 1989. He was a magnificent man, Mikhail Gorbachev, the greatest statesman of our age. And he had an idea that we could have an era of peace. And he called it our common European home. And he talked about a common home stretching from Rotterdam to Vladivostok. And I, I believed it and believe it till today that that was the right approach. And I, uh, he asked me to, uh, Gorbachev asked me to join his economic team, which I did. And my job was to try to help raise some emergency financing from the U.S. government to help a tottering Soviet economy that was in a profound financial crisis. And I had learned from John Maynard Keynes in the 20th century that you help countries in crisis so that they don't turn around and create crises later on. Keynes had warned against the harsh Versailles Treaty in 1919, worrying that it would bring to power in the next generation some horrors. And he, of course, was prescient in that. So I believe the same thing. I found that the U.S. was completely immovable in any kind of help for Gorbachev, any kind of financial help at all. Gorbachev, of course, uh, fell from power in uh, that putsch in August uh, 1989, and uh, Yeltsin came to dominance in Russia. And Yeltsin's uh, economic advisor, who became Prime Minister Yegor Gaidar, asked me to help. So I got to watch that a little bit close up. And what Yeltsin said to me on several occasions in 1989, we just want to be normal. We want to be a normal country again. This is very compelling. And I explained in my full innocence, President Yeltsin will help. You know, maybe they couldn't understand to help the Soviet Union. That was... Uh, just a leap of imagination too far for uh, the American leadership. But a new post-communist Russia, of course they're going to help. Have no worry, I said. And of course, there was no help at all that came from the United States. I won't belabor this uh, late hour anyway, uh, all of the dreadful missed opportunities but the mindset of the U.S. then was something that I would only come to understand over the following 30 years. So this carries us 30 years from Kennedy. Now I want to carry the next 30 years briefly, if I can. Basically, the United States could not take yes for an answer. In 1989, 1991, 1993, we had peace at our fingertips for the world. We had cooperation with Russia, completely possible. We were the world's sole superpower, the indispensable nation, Madeleine Albright told us. But we couldn't take the idea of peace seriously because it was in that moment that the new crowd came in and took power. The uh, ones that are in power until today, because it's been pretty much a continuous 30 years of what I think we can call the neocon ascension, 
that started in the mid-1990s and that continues in power today. And if there's one constant, if you want to see the face of that, it's our Deputy Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland. She's been everywhere. She's been Cheney's advisor. She's been Bush's ambassador. She's been Hillary Clinton's uh, advisor. She's now Biden's under, uh, she was under Secretary of State. Now she's Deputy Secretary of State. Now what couldn't they take yes about? They could not take yes that we could have a normal, respectful relationship with Russia. And after China's rise, that we could have a normal, respectful relationship with China. Because the project of the new American century, of Mr. Robert Kagan, Victoria's husband, and the project of this group, and basically it's the project of the military-industrial complex as well, the ones that are just as happy to be part of this, is that the United States needs to dominate the world in order to have peace, not just cooperate with the world. And this is the fundamental hubris and the fundamental assertion of power that has brought us to where we are today. We are not in danger because Russia was hostile, nor because Putin was hostile when he became president. Russia was not hostile, and Putin was not hostile. And Putin was not dreaming of reconstructing the Russian Empire or whatever little bit of silly propaganda we get fed each day. Russia wanted normalcy, wanted respect and normalcy. China would like respect and normalcy. Instead, we decided to surround Russia first and then China now with our military bases all around their borders and to flood the space with our military power because we are the indispensable nation. So rather than Kennedy's message, let's look inside and understand we can make peace with the other side, which even in the height of the Cold War succeeded, even when we had peace on our platter, when they had ended all claims and conflicts, we couldn't accept that. So as people probably know, in 1990, James Baker III, our Secretary of State at the time, and Hans Dietrich Genscher, the Foreign Minister of Germany, solemnly promised to Gorbachev repeatedly during 1990, NATO will never move eastward. By the way, you <coughs> no doubt read all the time that this is false, but it's true. And there's a long archive of materials demonstrating, which I'd be happy to send to anybody, uh, or you can just look it up at the George Washington University National Securities Archive. <clears throat> to make a, an interesting but long story short, starting with President Clinton, in starting with the project for a, a new American century, really starting with the neocons in the last year of the Bush administration, uh, with the Wolfowitz and Cheney and Rumsfeld, but then taken on because it's basically the military-industrial complex by the Clinton administration in the mid-1990s, championed by Madeleine Albright and uh, Richard Holbrook. NATO enlargement started. So we couldn't take peace for an answer rather than disbanding NATO, which would have been an absolutely plausible and right thing to do. We started to enlarge contrary to our promises. Three countries expanded in 1999, Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland, but then came George Bush and we went on NATO expansion uh, uh, on steroids so that in 2004, seven more countries joined NATO, Romania, Bulgaria, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Slovakia, and Slovenia. Now you have the Black Sea and you have uh, the Baltic states. And our idea was surround Russia, 
maybe break apart Russia. That would be nice. Decolonize Russia, as it came to be called, was the neocon idea. And the Russians, I know them, they kept saying, would you stop? You told us nothing. No expansion, not an inch eastward was the line. Now you're in the Baltic Sea, you're in the Black Sea, you're in the Baltic States, you're in the Balkans. What next? Well, George W. Bush Jr. gave them the next in 2008 when he faced down what was pretty good sense by the Europeans and insisted that NATO commit to expanding to Ukraine and to Georgia. And this was fulfilling a plan of Zbig Brzezinski that if we could surround Russia in the Black Sea region, we would end Russia's power, essentially, power projection in the eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East. And the Russians were saying, this is impossible. We're never going to allow ourselves to be surrounded. This is our naval fleet in Sevastopol, which you read about each day as our attack of missiles and a HIMARS bomb Sevastopol today. We're not going to allow that to happen. And in the meantime, under the same project, not only did we do that, but we unilaterally abandoned the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which was certainly the single most destabilizing act since Kennedy's partial nuclear test ban treaty. It ended up unraveling all of the nuclear agreements because the United States said we'll put missiles where we want and when we want them, and it's nobody's business. And, of course, we put the Aegis missile systems into Romania and Poland over the vociferous objections of Russia, and that, as much as anything, is why we have the war in Ukraine today. So we could not take yes for an answer. And the Russians kept saying, stop. Well, Ukraine elected a president in 2010 who said, this is getting too hot. We'll be neutral, thank you. Thank you, we'll be neutral. That was Viktor Yanukovych. Well, that drove the neocons crazy. So they knew they had to overthrow him. And when the opportunity arose in February 2014, Victoria Newland was our point person to overthrow Yanukovych. And it was a violent coup stirred by the United States. I happened to see some of it close up. It was quite ugly. And some of you, probably all of you, have heard Victoria Newland on tape three weeks before the violent events describing who would be the next prime minister. Very weird. Very unpleasant. We have a way of not discussing any of this in this country, by the way. So not any of this background has been discussed by the New York Times in its coverage of this crisis during this whole period, I can tell you, because I complain to them almost daily. And my fantasy is canceling my New York Times subscription after 60 years, but I can't bring myself to do it. All I do is just read it with disgust, but we still subscribe. In any event, this is what has brought us to where we are today. We have unilaterally abandoned all of the nuclear agreements. Others have expired. Others we never were willing to ratify, like the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. It's been 30 years when the United States said no to peace. So. For 30 years, we dug out of the Cold War from 1963 to 1993, and from 1993 to 2023, we recreated the Cold War. And we're in two hot wars today because of this hubris and this arrogance. It is not because Russia is an implacable foe. It is not because Putin is a vicious uh, megalomaniac uh, dreaming of recreating the Russian Empire. These events never had to take place. The United States has rejected every opportunity to negotiate, including two that people should understand. One was December 17, 2021, 
Putin put on the table a draft U.S.-Russia agreement to avoid a war, it said NATO will not enlarge the Ukraine. I called Jake Sullivan and said, Jake, you better negotiate. It was the one and last time he took my call. And I spent an hour trying to describe why there was one way out of this, and I've seen this for 30 years, and we're making a big mistake, and it's time to negotiate. Well, the U.S. gave the formal response <coughs> to Putin on January 26th, I believe it is 2022, when they said, NATO expansion is none of your business and it is non-negotiable. That's our official policy, that U.S. expansion of NATO to Ukraine is literally none of Russia's business. So we do what we want, and we expect that this is going to lead something desirable or to our security. And, of course, it leads to exactly the opposite. I won't uh, keep you uh, longer except to say that China, the situation with China is the same. We decided 10 years ago we need to contain China. Good luck with that. The main trading partner of virtually all the world, the low-cost provider of most of the key green technologies that the world needs, a country that has made stupendously successful and impressive efforts to escape from poverty <clears throat> that itself was largely caused by the outside world, by two opium wars, by the extraterritorial claims of the European and U.S. powers, by the Japanese invasions, and they escape from poverty, and instead of a nice word, every word is bad-mouthing China. That is a dictator. He's a this. He's a that. Again, we can't take yes for an answer. We have to seemingly create the enemies to have our enemies and to expand our military everywhere. We were just in Australia. Well, we were in Taiwan a couple of months ago. That's the Ukraine of the coming years if we continue on this policy. We say we'll arm you to make you safe. If we send arms to Taiwan, we will make them the bullseye, believe me. It's the stupidest thing in the world we could do would be to arm Taiwan the way we're talking about doing. And it would be the most suicidal for them to accept it, but they probably will. It's hard not to accept that. That's what Ukraine discovered too late. We have your back. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have anybody's back, not even our own. We don't have Israel's back. We don't have anybody's back. The world has changed so much that we can't keep anybody safe. We can't even keep the American people safe the way we're going. The world does not abide by our foreign policy. The world does not accept NATO enlargement. The world does not accept what Biden said or did in the last two days in Israel. The world sees things in a different way. They don't want one hegemonic power. They want political solutions. They want a Palestinian state. So do I. Why not after 60 years of this? So they understand that this is about politics. They understand it was not a good idea for the U.S. to push NATO to Ukraine and to Georgia. They understand it was not a good idea for Nancy Pelosi to fly to Taiwan, that that doesn't make Taiwan safe. That makes Taiwan endangered. That's how the world sees this. So let me speak one minute about the next 30 years. We had a good 30 years that President Kennedy started, not good in every way, but good in the sense of beginning to get this nuclear demon back under control. We had another 30 years of American hubris 
that has brought us to war and geopolitical tensions that are unrivaled since the height of the Cold War, and according to the Doomsday Clock, are even worse than during the Cold War because we had also the environmental catastrophes that are on our doorstep at the same time as the geopolitical risks that we face. So we never before were 90 seconds to midnight, not even in the Cuban Missile Crisis. But what we have seen is it's possible to change course. This is, as we say in economics, this is endogenous. This is not something that comes from the outside. This is a choice for us to make. As Kennedy said, the ability to achieve peace depends on our own thinking even more than the other side. Depends on our own attitudes towards peace. And so this is why the work of this wonderful foundation is so essential. As Kennedy said, we are not gripped by forces that we cannot control. Our problems are man-made, and therefore they can be solved by man. This is a group that can help and is helping to decisively lead to the change of world view. I can tell you outside there is every possibility of making peace. Peace with China is possible. Peace with Russia is possible. There are no implacable foes outside. Peace with Iran is possible. What they want is respect from the United States. What they want is not to be crowded by missiles and military bases and regime change operations and the CIA by the United States. And I couldn't agree with them more. So please, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of work to do. You are leaders. I'm with you. And I'm sure that we can change the trajectory and make a path towards peace.